All right. Well, good morning, everybody. All right. It's so good to, to be here, to be sharing God's word with you, and just want to take the opportunity to greet those of you who are watching in our campuses today in Derby and New Milford and in Waterbury as well. For those of you online, our online friends, uh, good morning to you as well. My name is Brian. I'm one of the lead pastors here, and it's just a, a joy to be able to preach today alongside my friend and pastor Craig Horn. So thank you, Craig, for being with us today. Thanks for having me. You bet. And so we are in a series right now called Walking Wisely. We've been going through different Proverbs in the book of Proverbs. And today, our topic is real friendship. And so I found the closest thing. I thought this was a roast. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so Craig and I want to talk about friendship today, and we're going to speak a little bit out of our own friendship as well. But there's a few reasons that we want to talk about friendship. And, and the first is that through Scripture, you see friendship talked about all the time, particularly in the book of Proverbs. You see the writer of Proverbs continually talking about the value of friendship. Uh, even when you go all the way at the beginning of the story of the Bible in the book of Genesis, when God creates all things and he creates human beings and he creates Adam, there was something that wasn't good. And the one thing that wasn't good was that Adam was alone. So he creates Eve, this friend, this person to walk alongside, to be with, uh, to befriend. And so it's so important that we have good friends. And the Bible talks about that throughout Scripture. And today we're going to focus on three passages out of the book of Proverbs. But the other reason that I really wanted to talk about friendship is that I believe in our world today we have a friendship crisis. Friendship crisis. I wonder for any of you, are any of your friendships uh, under any level of stress right now? Have they been? Maybe even in your families, has there been um, stress, pressure over these last couple years? And uh, I think that we are in a friendship crisis in fact, I think that we have many people out there who probably would say, man, I feel really, really lonely right now. I found a, a study that uh, Harvard did, and they found that 30% of Americans would say that they are lonely either sometimes or all of the time, 30% of people. They said that between the ages of 18 and 25, that stat jumps to 60% of our young people would say that I often feel lonely or always feel lonely. This sounds like a friendship crisis to me, a uh, loneliness crisis. And so Pastor Craig and I want to talk a little bit about that. Before we go any further, though, yeah. uh, Craig, I, I wanted you to share with our friends here just kind of a little bit about our friendship so yeah. they kind of get an idea of where we're coming from and who's speaking to them on this topic. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, our friendship is very complicated. It's complex. <laughs> This is my boss over here, right? So uh, I'll make sure the things I'm saying don't take my uh, Christmas bonus away. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. So we have to be friends. It, we, yeah, so at the moment we have to. And listen, dashing looks and, and great wit is hard on the friendship. You know what I mean? So <laughs> the, the, tr the truth is, is that we are two very different dudes, all right? Um, I like birds, all right? I don't have an issue with going to a restaurant with exotic animals, okay? <laughs> I, I, I have different hair, I have a different style. Um, Brian has a great personality. You know, I mean, these things are, are what we share and not share. But what mm -hmm. we have in common is our love for Jesus Christ. That isn't in question. Right. Um, we respect each other as men of God. And we know that God has called us to different things and we promote and we push each other in those places. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's very important for me. I, I'm not asking Brian to be me and he's not asking me to be him. Um, so I think that is for me the base of our friendship. And I think in that base... We are pushing each other to be great husbands, great fathers, yep. and, and great friends. Yep. And, uh, and also, we have a good laugh. Uh, yep. Laughing is very important. But I think for me, those are the pieces where I think our, our friendship has really has landed. And in that friendship, and when you have core friends, there's a couple of things that you can, you can glean. So one of the things I've gleaned from, from, from Brian, this is for the Christmas bonus, in case you're wondering, um, is that his, his, his search for excellence. I know we were away one time with the families, and uh, we were talking about hibachi. I mean, who, who doesn't like hibachi in here? Anybody who doesn't like hibachi, we can never be friends. Okay, so <laughs> everybody loves hibachi, and we were talking about it, just randomly just talking about it, and we, we went our separate ways, and I came back, and, and Brian was on his phone fiddling, and I was like, hey, what are you doing? You're like researching the Trinity, you know, what are you doing? Like, what are you, you know what I mean? Where we're, we're going Something here. very spiritual. Very spiritual. He's like, I'm checking out hibachi. 
I'm like, okay, like we could go down the road. It's real easy. And he's like, no, no, no. I want to make a bocce. <laughs> For the next couple of hours, this guy is in his phone, computer. He's networking to the satellites. He's really trying to find out what the bocce scene is. And that night, we had one of the best hibachi meals I've ever yes. had. The rice was a little bit hard, but other than that, it was really, really good, right? But I'm talking from the onions, the, everything. He, his, his search for excellence was, hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it well. And I really respect that and it's pushed me in, in my life. And then I think just our families have grown together in this space as we've spent time together. So a huge blessing. Mm. Oh, that's good. Thanks, Greg. You know, folks who don't like my sermons are now they figured out why. He's spending too much time researching hibachi. hibachi yeah. right? He's like, this guy needs to get off the hibachi channel. But um, yeah, so we wanted to speak to you out of a place of friendship as we talk about friendship. And um, you know, I think I found this, uh, this, this book, it's written actually for, for youth, and it's written by this, this guy named Kurt Johnston, and he is the family pastor at Saddleback Church. That's Rick Warren's church, and he wrote this book called My Friends. And in it, he gives this diagram of the different kinds of friends that we have. And I thought this was really important. You're gonna, you're gonna see this come up on the screen in a little bit too, but he talks about different categories of friends, and it's important to know what we're talking about when we're talking about friends today. Mm. And he, he first talks about these casual friends, these friends that you have maybe because you work with them or you attend church, you pass by in the hallways of your school and, and you say hello to them. Uh, these are those kinds of friends. You're friends with them. You don't, maybe you don't know a lot about them. Maybe there's little trust but, but you're, you're acquaintances in one sense. Then there's this next ring, and, and that's this ring of close friends. These are people that you're inviting over, that you're calling when you have a free night to go out. Uh, you enjoy their company. Uh, you're, you're getting to know them. They're close friends. There's a level of trust with these friends. For many people, this is where the, the friendship barrier kind of stops but what we want to talk about is this next level of friendship, and that's what he calls core friends. Now, a core friend, you might only have a handful of core friends. You might only have two core friends, but these are people that you trust. These are people that you've committed to in a relationship. These are people that when crisis happens, you're calling them first. Uh, you're reaching out to them. You're caring for them as they care for you. You're walking, you're journeying in life, and there's a different level of vulnerability in this friendship as well. Now, as we looked at this list, we thought that there's a ring missing, and I'm not sure when he wrote this book, but, but in today's world, I think there's another ring, and um, that's what, what we're calling counterfeit friends. And that's the biggest ring, and I think that many people have these counterfeit friends. You might ask, hey, how many friends do you have? And someone will say, oh, I have 3,000 friends. Only 3,000? Only 3,000, right? That's nothing. I've got 10,000 friends. Wow, that's a, amazing. Yeah, yeah, look at the number on my Facebook page, on my Instagram page. Look at all these amazing friends that I have. But they're actually not friends. I hate to break that to you, friends. They're really not your friends. They're counterfeit friends. They're, it's just a number. These aren't people that you're really engaging in life, walking through life with. And so today, we want to talk about core friends, uh, these people that the Bible really speaks about having in your life. And the way we want to do that is to look at three passages out of the book of Proverbs and then uh, give you three kind of lessons within each, each of those. So the first is this, is that good friends are chosen wisely. This comes out of Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. It says this, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. I love the book of Proverbs, don't you? It's just so clear. There's no mincing words. There's no like, you know, kind of uh, flowery wording here. No, it's like walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. You know, one of the most important things I think you can do in your life is choose your friends. Mm. One of the most important things that you can do is choose your friends and choose them wisely. Essentially what this passage is saying is this. Listen, bad friends lead to trouble. How many of you remember a time in life where you got into bad company and it wasn't good for you? You don't have to raise your hands, but I know we've all probably gone through that. Wow, <laughs> this friend is pulling me in the wrong direction or how about, how many of you know times in your life where you've had a good friend and it's led you into good things, it's led you into wisdom? And so choosing your friends is really important. And so I wanted Craig just to share with us a little bit about that. 
you know, if choosing your friends is important, then how do we choose friends wisely? Yeah, so one of the things I started realizing, um, some of you know I was born and raised in South Africa and then came to America, and I, I'm starting to realize in these seasons of friendship. I'm also realizing there's, there's times to let friends go and also times to investigate new ones. And I think for me that's very important because sometimes we lock ourselves into friendships and if they aren't healthy, they, they drag us for the, for the longest time and, yeah. and they may not be very good for us. And sometimes we meet people that are great and we just go, oh, they're great, where we actually should be engaging in and with them um, to, to see what they can add to our lives and, and ask to this. So I wanted to also say, I, I have friends, I have one or two that are core friends that aren't Christ followers. I just wanted to throw that out there. We're not just mm. pushing everyone. Since we're in church and since this is, I think, a different level of conversation, I think the friends I have who are core that know Christ, there's a different vulnerability. There's a different accountability. There's a different feel to the relationship because we, we're based in Christ. And I think for me, it's important in these areas to, to spend time with God. If you're looking for a Christ-like friend, to spend time with them and evaluate your friends and say, is there a friend that I have that is drawing me closer to Christ? Yeah. All right? I, I need that in my life. So Lord, you know me, you've designed me, you've knitted me together. You know who that person is. So Lord, keep my eyes open, allow my spirit to be kindled with someone else mm. so that I can have that friendship that I need. Because I do believe, I think, even in the Adam and Eve story, God, God brought them together, but the enemy is always trying to separate. Yeah. Yep. And the enemy wants you to be alone. He, he wants you to not be loved. He wants you to think that you're on your own. So the, the idea of coring with someone is, is essential to God's plan, and yep. it's, it's counsel to the enemy wants, wants to snap that. So a couple of things. I think location is key. I mean, if you're going to your local club and strip club looking for core friends, it's not going to happen. Yep. I wish you well in that situation, okay? Yep. Let's just be honest. And I think the next part is as the Lord reveals to you who this person is in location, church is a great place, um, you start looking and saying to the Lord, okay, now, now I feel kindred to this person, does this person have God-like character? Mm. Is this person gonna be able to shift me from where I am to where I need to be? And if that is something that starts resonating with you and the Lord, then I say you have to pursue that. Yeah. Some people just sit and go, well, we're best friends. Well, hang on, like, what does that look like? What are you doing? And then push into that and see what the Lord does with that. Yeah, absolutely. I would say a couple of things into this is you need to know what you're looking for. I think about, we were just recently looking for a car. We needed a different car. And uh, we started to talk about it. What kind of car should we get? What would suit our family? And we did all of that before just kind of going to the lot to pick out a car. And so you need to know what you're looking for. And scripture actually tells us about good godly character. And, um, and now that you know what you're looking for in a core friend, in this true kind of trusting friend, now you can begin to, to look for that once you know what you're actually looking for. And the other thing I would say into this, just as you're speaking, Craig, is that I think it's really important you choose your friends wisely by taking the next steps. Um, you know, we need to gather together. S some folks might be saying, well, I don't really have any core friends. Well, you need to go to those places, like Craig was saying, where you can find those, those kinds of friendships. Well, this is one of them. In our campuses, this is one of them. Come, if, if you're nearby and you're able, come, worship with us. It's so good to be in the fellowship of one another, and this is where you can begin to discover good friends. And if you do regularly worship and gather together and you still are kind of, well, I don't know, I, I don't really have that core friendship, maybe you need to take the next step. Get into a small group, into a group of people. We have all kinds of opportunities through men's ministry, women's ministry, community groups, all kinds of stuff. Take the next step and actually begin to get yourself around people who could become those core friends. Another one I would say to you is this, is begin to serve. Some of my closest friends came out of times where I've ser served alongside of them. Serve in the life of the church. Serve in your community. Get around people that love to serve. And that's gonna be a, a place where you can really discover close friendships too. The last thing I'll say in this is that I really sense this like, word for, for young people. And maybe it's because I'm, I'm the father of four young people. Uh, but this would extend into, into young adults as well. And I guess I would say this, friends, choose your friends wisely. <laughs> right now, is, it's such a critical moment in your life as a young adult, as a high school, middle school student, that choosing your friends is so important. You know, it's your friends that can influence your happiness, those who you choose to put around you. It's your friends who will influence your potential. Have you ever had that friend that just dragged you down? Uh, a good friend can actually bring you into things you could never think or imagine. Wow, I didn't know I had that potential. It's, uh, it's your friends who influence who you become. Mm. 
what you sound like oftentimes is the result of who you put around you. It's so important, so important uh, to choose your friends wisely. Second thing that we want to share is this. Well, not, the yeah. other thing we said, I think, because you love birds so much, is that birds of a feather flock together. That's right. And I think, <laughs> since you love birds, um, so I think that piece there, I think, kind of ties it down. I had one other thought as you were saying that. It was this idea of, for young people, when you're choosing your partner, yeah. And this is a life choice, right? And I think if you don't choose your best friend, uh, it gets really, really hard. So yeah. even an extra push, young people who are, who are dating, you know, looking to be married, is, is to find that godly character, align them as being your best yeah. friend and see what the Lord does with that. Absolutely, absolutely. The second passage we wanted to, to speak into is Proverbs 18, verse 24. It says this, there are friends, and, and friends is in quotes, who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. Uh, the, the lesson here is that good friends become family. Uh, when you have a good friend, it's like they're a part of your family. Have you experienced that? Has anybody experienced that? Yeah, these, these good friends, they become family. Uh, there are friends who destroy each other, but real friends stick closer than a brother. You see the two sides of this, is that there are these counterfeit friends that really aren't for you. They're bad friends, but then there are real friends, these good friends who stick closer than a brother or sister. You know, in this, what Craig and I want to do is we want to give you just a little picture of what a bad friend looks like. And then we want to give you a picture of what a good friend looks like, okay? And so I drew the straw of what a bad friend looks like. A lot like. of examples. Yep, it's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's be it fits better, right? And uh, so actually I went to the book of Proverbs again, and there are many lessons about what a bad friend looks like. Now, let me also say this, and Pastor Craig already said it, is that even we, we should have some friends that fit into these categories, <laughs> We're to be the light into the world. Um, this doesn't mean that you're to cut all these people out of your life. They're probably just not going to be those core level friends, right? Uh, and so I and so just wanted to say that before I, I moved into this. But here's a, a few lessons from the book of Proverbs about bad friends. The first is this. A bad friend leads you in the wrong direction. Proverbs 12 says this. The godly give good advice to their friends. The wicked lead them astray. A bad friend is anybody who leads you in the wrong dis uh, direction. When at the end of the day you say, how did I get here? Oh, this friend convinced me, persuaded me, thought that this would be a good idea. Uh, that's, that's not a good friend. Secondly, a bad friend continually gossips. Proverbs 16 says this, a troublemaker plants seeds of strife. Gossip separates the best of friends. I like to say this, if you find that your friend gossips a lot, that means when they're not with you, guess what they're gossiping about? You. <laughs> you. It's not a good friend, somebody who leans towards gossiping all the time, uh, sharing things that they shouldn't be sharing. That's not somebody that you want to trust with vulnerable things. Another one, a bad friend refuses to forgive. Proverbs 17 says, love prospers when a fault is forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. It's not a good friend if they constantly bring out that one thing that you asked for forgiveness for years ago. Oh, don't you remember that one thing? They just continue to drag that one or two or three things back into the relationship. Um, no, a good friend is able to forgive, to release uh, to really model the life of Jesus in your friendship. Next, a, bed, a bad friend always argues. Proverbs 20 says, avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. Maybe you have those friends where no matter the topic, no matter what's on the news, no matter what you're speaking about around the table, it's an argument. It's an opportunity to fight. Uh, this is not a good friendship. It's not helpful to sow those seeds into your life where you're constantly arguing, where you're constantly trying to win a fight. Mm. Two more. A bad friend lacks control. Proverbs 22 says, don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. Wow, <laughs> that's like serious stuff, isn't it? That is a serious statement. You know, you don't want those core friends to be people that lack control. 
that just fly off the handle at any, every little thing. And finally, a bad friend flatters instead of loves. In Proverbs 29, it says, to flatter friends is to lay a trap for their feet. In Psalm 62, it says, they praise me to my face, but curse me in their hearts. Flattery is going, you know, oh, you're so great, you're so wonderful, but really not believing it and going and living in a different way and saying things in a different way when you can't hear it. You don't want a friend that just flatters you to make you feel good. Uh, You want a friend that's gonna stick close to you, a friend that's gonna be truthful with you. And so that's a little bit of what a bad friend might look like. Let's not stay there for too long. (laughs) Let's move into what a good friend looks like. And Craig, can you talk to us a little bit about what a good friend looks like? Yeah, I found 1 Samuel 18 uh, from a friend of mine told me, just check this story out. It probably aligns with, uh, with what you're preaching about. Thank you, Pastor Jim. And uh, so I looked into it, and I, I see three characters here. Um, I see King Saul, his son Jonathan, and David. And in the very beginning, David and Jonathan become really good friends. Actually, they make a covenant together. Right, very interesting they make this covenant. Actually, um, Jonathan gives him his robe and a couple other things. He kind of bows his knee to David, knowing that David's going to be eventually the king. Just that is massive for me, okay, because Jonathan's father's the king, and he, he should be maybe heir, right? Yeah. But he bows his knee to this friendship. But then he, he does a covenant. He says, I will love you like I love myself. Mm. Very powerful, powerful statement. And I want to st- stop there just for a second. If you don't love yourself, not a lover of yourself, but if you don't love yourself, you're going to have a hard time with your friendships, because you're gonna bring that brokenness and that ugliness into the friendship because you don't know who you are and who mm. you're called to be. So just a side note there. So Jonathan's top draw, he says, listen, I, I'm for you like I'm for myself. Mm. And I, I, I'm here for you no matter what. Well, when we make these statements sometimes, also in front of God, the covenant, it's very important that we own them. And, and Jonathan does, because David comes to him and says, listen, man, I, I hear that your father wants to kill me. Mm-hmm. So he says, can you do some recon and just find out, is this legit? Like, is this proper? Like, does he really want to kill me? Mm. And if he does, can you give me some information so I can get out of here? Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to be killed. It's just something I don't want to do. You know what I mean? So he says, let me find out. So they make a plan. If it's him saying, I I want to kill you, I'll give you a signal and you can get get out of town. So Jonathan goes to his dad. He says, hey, listen, what's happening with David? You know, what's going on? He says, yeah, actually, I want to kill him. Mm. Jonathan's like, oh, my golly. And I was just thinking, if I was Jonathan, you know, he's the king, his dad, now, what does, he, what does he do with that? Because now when he goes to David, he could be going behind his father's back, right? There could right. be a distrust there. But what I love about this is that the covenant that he made with David was in the eyes of God, and he chose what was right over what was maybe emotionally easier or mo- emotionally right. right. And he goes to David, does this crazy thing, shoots some arrows, and David gets a signal, and he, he leaves. And he, he, he lives another day, and eventually he becomes king. Yeah. And if I'm Jonathan, I'm like, mm, I could become king. Right. Maybe, you know, do something different. Right. Or I don't want to just, just honor my dad or the king. So what happens here is this amazing moment when he chooses what is right over emotion. And I think in our friendships, especially in this day and age, we have to choose what is right. We have to speak into our friends, and into yeah. our relationship, if it's worth anything. And I think that covenant that he made with God pushed him into a place where he did the right thing. And yeah. I think as friends, we have to start stepping into these places and really speaking truth in love to see if there's any worth in our friendships. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this is why we find ourselves in a friendship crisis yeah. in our world today is because we've lost the idea of covenanting together. Correct. Um, God models this for us. He's a covenanting God. We should all say amen to that. Mm-hmm. He's, a coven- he's covenanted with us. Uh, this is why he's extended grace to us mm-hmm. and forgiveness to us because he's covenanted with us that you know, he is going to be our God. We're going to be his children. No matter what. No matter what. Yeah. He's covenant, so God doesn't you know, run away when we make these mistakes or say something offensive or wrong. No, God sticks with us no matter what. And we've lost that in our culture in terms of our friendships, this covenanting is that in, in some friendships, I think they're even looking for opportunities to run away. You know, at, at the slightest disagreement or offense, yeah. you know, just gone. And um, I think what we can model to the world as Christ followers is what it means to covenant in friendship together. Uh, to stick closer than a brother or sister together, um, to even when things are not easy. In fact, it's in the times that things are not easy that our friendships can sometimes be molded and shaped and strengthened the most. So why would we run from those in our friendships? Instead, we should run to our friendships in those moments. 
And um, I love this idea of covenanting with one another. I was thinking about that. You might think to yourself, well, what does that mean to covenant with somebody? Do I have to like write up a contract? Do we have to like really, literally sign it? Yeah, do we have to become blood brothers? No. I think what a covenant is you, you live it out. You live out this covenant style uh, relationship with one another saying, I'm going to stick with this person. I'm going to walk with them. Uh, uh, through thick and thin. And that's, that's what Jonathan and David had. He, he could have ran at any moment, yeah. and even to his advantage right. could have ran, uh, but he didn't. The third thing and, and final thing we want to share is this, is that uh, in Proverbs twenty seven seventeen it says this, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. And the lesson here is that good friends should strengthen one another. Actually, the friendships that we have should make us better people. Mm. Uh, the friendships that we have should, should sharpen us in lots of different areas of our life. And so we want to talk a little bit about how a good friend uh, should sharpen us. Yes. All right. So I've got the first one, being spiritually sharp. I think if you're in a friendship that's in this core level, the idea is that they will spiritually, they would, they would, they would help you grow in your faith. And mm -hmm. I, I think for myself, I want someone challenging me like, hey, what are you reading about? What's the Lord teaching you? you know yeah. I mean? Are you praying? Are you spending time with the Lord? And I think in reverse, I want to be someone in this friendship who's spiritually pushing the other person. So I know for ourselves, like prophetic words or words of knowledge, I know there's yeah. been times in our lives when we've really needed to hear from the Lord yeah. and, and we've leaned on each other and the Lord has showed up. And yeah. I think that is a very, very important part of, of a core friendship. Absolutely, absolutely. Not only do we get spiritually sharp through our friendships, and these core friendships, but this one's a little bit different, but I think actually we can become physically sharp through good friendships. Um, you know, it's a good friend who can look at you and say, you know what, I think there's some unhealthy habits in your life right now. Uh, you should correct those, or can I help you in that? And actually, a good friend can help us become more uh, physically sharp. And, and that could just be in our own health. It could be as practical as what we eat and how we exercise uh, and just other habits that we have in life. And a good friend, a core friend, is able to, in love, actually push us uh, in a healthy way in, in our physical sharpness. Um, there's the, a vulnerability in there. That there's is a big vulnerability being there. Being created that you can take that person and say, this person wants good for me. Yes. I'm not like, oh, here we go. So we're going to get into a Barney. It's like, no, this person actually wants best for me, so I'm going to listen. And yes. that, that's when it's tight. That's when yes. it's really cool. That's right. The other one is that I think good friends help us become missionally sharp. A good friend, a core level friend, knows how God has gifted you and knows the purpose that the Lord has on your life and the call that God has on your life. And a good friend will say, hey, 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 Brian, you're spending way too much time over here on hibachi, right? <laughs> Stick to what God's called you to. You know, man, hey, Brian, man, I, I really sense the Lord is saying this to you, but you're kind of, you're drifting. Remember your mission. Remember your call in life. And so a good friend, a core friend who's seeking the Lord on your behalf helps you stay missionally sharp, which is so important. Yeah. Then I got uh, mentally sharp. Um, I think this is something that I, I have to pay attention to. If you give me a TV or an iPhone or something that is in front of me, I can go numb and I can get lazy. And I think mentally sharp is something we as a culture and society have lost, like sitting around a table, putting phones away, having a meal, mm. having something to drink and just chatting and really activating your brain and activating you mentally just stimulates you and, and actually can push you further in, in a lot of areas of your life if your brain is working. We spoke yeah. about the study, even just if you are laughing, yeah. you're spending time with someone and you're laughing with them, like your, your body and your brain, it activates, it, it, it gets you to a stronger place. And I think for me, I want to be with people who want to sit at a table and talk about life so that I can learn, so they can learn and, and I can be a better human being. Yeah, absolutely. One more, okay, got me there. <laughs> Social shop. So I think socially for me is, is another huge one, and especially for me as a South African, I came to America and the cultures are so different. I'm operating thinking I'm doing this great, great thing and my friends are like, dude, you're gonna end up in jail. You can't be doing that. You know, like this is not how this works here. So I think socially, like it's very important, just even today's climate with some of the things that are going on, there's some hot buttons yeah. in our society right now. And I think if you don't have a narrative, a place to go and speak to a friend about how, how do I say this? How do I, does this sound weird? Does this sound aggressive, does this sound whatever, socially finding these guys and, mm. and or, or girls and talking into them and, and finding a narrative that can protect you yeah. can actually help you in your faith and actually help your friendship. Yeah, absolutely. So many times in my life it was somebody else who said, hey, you need to be going in this direction, doing this, or watch out for this, yeah. that really saved me or led me into you know, really God's will for my life. 
And um, I can't tell you how important it is to have these core level friends in your life. I pray that you have those core level friends, but I also realize that for many people, they don't have them. And so we want to give, give just some practical application here in this moment. And uh, many of you who have been around the church for a while have heard us talk about our crews. And we, we talk about a crew and how every person should have a crew. And that's three to five people that you travel through life with, that you're intentional with. These are core level friends, your, your peer group of people. You're praying for one another. Uh, you're opening up. You're talking about what God is speaking into your life. Uh, and, and you're walking through life in, in, in life's hardships, but also in life's celebrations. These are people that you've really invited uh, to journey with you. I want to encourage you in this moment, maybe some of you have a crew, but it needs to be rekindled. Mm. Uh, this would be the time to do it. Rekindle that crew. Bring it back together. And maybe for some of you, you don't have this level of friendships. And I want to encourage you to start a crew. Think and pray about who could be those crew members with you. And then begin to go out and invite them. Now here's the thing. You might get rejected. I actually, the first crew, I went to somebody and asked to be in my crew. Guess what? They said no. Well, you needed that. You needed to hear I that. I needed that. Yeah. I was like, but I'm the pastor. You ready? What's happening? What's happening here? You have to, you're supposed to say yes. Mm -hmm. But they said, no, I already have a crew. That's fine. That, that's actually great. I'm so thankful that you have a crew. Wonderful. And then I went and we found some other crew members. And so you also need to find crew members. And don't be worried if somebody else says, hey, I can't because of this reason. That's okay. Maybe that's not who God has you to be in a crew with. And so just continue to pursue and ask the Lord who should be in your crew. This is what a crew is. One, they should, you should meet intentionally. You should have regular times when you are meeting. If I went to one of your crew members and said, hey, when do you guys meet? And they say, I don't know what you're talking about. They're not a crew member. You should be meeting with them weekly or bi-weekly. I would say monthly is not enough, but maybe it could be monthly. But I would say at least bi-weekly, you're meeting with them. Uh, you're asking good questions of one another. Let me give you a couple. You're asking, hey, how's your first 20 going? What's God saying to you as you meet with him each morning? You're asking, you know, what is God saying through his word to you? As you spend time studying his word, you can see a level of accountability that's happening here too, right? As you're vulnerable. What do you sense that God is saying to you right now? How are you stewarding the gifts and the resources God has given you? These are really good questions that you could actually ask every time you get together and then you could pray for one another and it's gonna be a valuable time. And maybe even these casual friends that you invite into a crew will become core level friends mm -hmm. as you meet together. Last, I wanted to just look to Craig and say, I know you have a crew, yeah. and how has this been a blessing in your life? Well, um, just to start off with, Brian isn't in my crew, and that wasn't because he doesn't like birds and exotic animals at restaurants. It was more that we just were seeking differently, and I think that's important to understand. I think, like, in my group, I have now two new core friends, and mm. outside of my group, I have a bunch of other core friends. So this is not like the secret select group. It's just how the Lord has landed it. Yeah. But um, my crew meets uh, every other week, and um, we're pretty intentional about it, except for one of the guys, I won't mention his name, but he doesn't always remember, and he is not always on time, okay? And I'm Look not, into the camera really yeah, sternly you know, right now. <laughs> I, and I told you I was going to tell it, so you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so that's a warning to him. But um, when, when we meet, there's something about it, you know, we, we, we sit down and we have a good laugh. It's always over a cup of coffee, and um, we just relax. We, we kind of just get into our day. But where we start really pressing in afterwards, not even necessarily those questions, we may have started with them, we kind of know each other now, but we, we want to hold each other accountable as, as men of God, as husbands, mm. you know, as fathers, as friends, and, and we push in. And when we push in, it, it's something in the vulnerability of knowing that you can have a place to speak where there's freedom to be yourself, but also to hear things you need to hear because sometimes we have filters or blinders that we don't always know. And, and these guys are, are in this space and they're talking to me, I'm talking to them. And I know, without a doubt, if I was to text them right now because you're giving me a hard time, they would run onto the stage and grab you. You know what I mean? They got my back. These dudes are like, hey, I need your help. They're in it. They my, are in it. My crew could beat up your exactly, crew. Exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> One of my guys may be late, but listen, <laughs> he'll be here. So anyway, my, my point being is like, I know, I know, no matter what the circumstance, when I check in with these cats, yeah. they, are, they are there for me. And that's, it's yeah. a blessing. Absolutely. We wanted to close by asking you, what kind of friends do you have? Uh, do you have counterfeit friends? Do you have casual friends? Do you have close friends? 
Do you have core level friends? And we want to challenge you, not just encourage you, we want to challenge you, if you don't have a crew yet, to begin a crew. Maybe your first step to a crew is coming to worship weekly and being around the fellowship of believers and getting to know people. Maybe your next step into a crew is joining a small group to get to know people at a deeper level, discovering who these people are. Or maybe you know right now who you should be asking and you just haven't done it yet. We want to challenge you to start that crew, get in it. I believe it's going to be life transformational for you to be in a crew. And if we can help along the way, please reach out. We'd love the chance to be able to help you in that. Well, friends, we pray that this has been helpful for all of us, that it's been challenging, uh, and we pray that we might have a closer walk together as brothers and sisters uh, as we uh, practice real friendship, not counterfeit friendship. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.